Uh, my name is Ross Bogertis. Uh, I've been uh, dorking around in IT for more than 20 years now. I actually have a structural engineering degree uh, that I abandoned an eon ago, back in the late 90s, um, and just rode that wave of, I was the guy who knew how to use the computer in the office when there was no IT administrator. Right, so even my first job as a structural engineer at a log home company, um, no one wanted to touch the Novell, uh, the Novell system, right? <laughs> Which is uh, what we were using for storing all of our uh, architectural drafting files and whatnot. Um, so I was suddenly responsible for that, um, and also uh, responsible for the fixing the network when the drafters kicked the 10 base 2 cable loose and everybody lost all their saved data all at once, right? Which made all the drafters cry a lot, right? So anyway, so um, um, I've been messing around with this for years. I've typically always known just enough to be dangerous, but if you hang around Wireshark long enough, I think that's what all of us know. Uh, just different levels of it. Uh, so um, what I do today, uh, I've been a network engineer. Uh, I managed uh, and supported and ran a network at UW Hospital and Clinics in Madison, Wisconsin for about seven years uh, amongst uh, some really brilliant other engineers. Today uh, I'm a Pluralsight author and a technical speaker. Um, if you don't know what Pluralsight is, it's a mouthful. Uh, plural, like many, sight, like to see. Uh, we offer all kinds of IT education, um, uh, Netflix style, right? Pay a monthly subscription and watch all you want. So I've, I, uh, my main role on there is to teach data networking. Um, I'm not a big fan of the certifications, but I do all the certification training on there for CCNA, NetPlus, and whatnot. My take on it, though, is not to teach you how to pass the exam. My take on it is how to teach you how the packets move through the network, all right? So I, I developed this course because, um, uh, I developed this presentation because uh, uh, TLS and SSL and encryption are becoming more and more popular. It's a fascinating topic, and if you read online about it and you try to get information from somebody's blog post or technical article or white paper, uh, it tends to fall in one of three categories that I found. Either it's somebody that says, oh, this is so easy, the public key encrypts the data, the private key decrypts the data, boom. Well, that's kind of true sometimes, maybe, and oftentimes not at all true at all, right? And it's missing the point of it, right? It doesn't do enough explanation of it. The other articles that I've read will, uh, will do a, a really great explanation of the beginning of how TLS works, and then you can tell the author quickly gets tired and uh, loses interest and can't figure out what's happening next. And the third articles that you read about it are the mathematicians. Um, the, I remember some of this math from engineering college, right? Uh, if, I'm sure there's some math nerds in here that know this stuff really, really well. But for the most of us, we don't care about the math so much, we just want to be able to decrypt our traffic so that we can analyze what the heck is going on. So, uh, the goals that I have for this um, is, uh, I want to go through a very brief, whoops, jumping ahead too far here. I want to go through, <laughs> all right, I want to do a very brief history, all right, I don't want to spend a lot of time in the history, I'm not going to talk about all the different attacks that broke all the different versions of SSL. Uh, this topic is broad, uh, there are many subtopics that are involved in it. It gets messy in a hurry, so I want to stay focused on some very specific things about this topic, right? So I want to talk a very brief history, though, because this stuff is actually kind of old uh, when, when we really look at it. I want to talk about encrypting data and how that works. Now, this is, for everybody in the room, I expect us to have some idea of how data encryption works, right? Especially if you've seen the movie uh, A Christmas Story, right, with the Annie Oakley decoder ring or the Ovaltine decoder ring. The secret that I want to talk about here is the key exchange process. What I have learned for myself personally is if you can understand what's happening with the key exchange, we can understand why and how uh, our Wireshark decryption works. 
all right, how that is happening, what information we need to capture in order to do the decryption in Wireshark. So I want to spend some time talking about this. I actually want to show you the math involved in this. If, has anybody seen the math for Diffie-Hellman? A couple, couple of you probably have, right? Um, and the cool part is, is the math for Diffie-Hellman key exchange is really accessible. All right, it's super, uh, super accessible for most of us. We just don't use it on a regular basis and we don't need to. But I want to show you how simple that is. Um, I want to talk about the data encryption protocols that we use. There's only a couple, so that's pretty easy. And then what I want to do is I want to talk about TLS 1.2 and 1.3 handshakes. I want to take a look at them because 1.3 is relatively new now, but companies like Facebook and Cloudflare are implementing this right now. So I have some captures that we can take a look at and see the difference. And 1.3 is actually really, really slick. The problem with looking at these handshakes is that we can't actually see some of the information being exchanged because the handshake itself gets encrypted after a certain point, which is why we need to understand the key exchange process. So what we'll do then is we'll I'll actually show you how to decrypt, how to capture the session key and do the decryption in Wireshark so that we can go look deeper into the TLS handshake. All right? So again, this topic is, is very broad, there are lots of subtopics on it, I'm trying to keep a very narrow focus on this so we can walk away with an understanding of what's actually happening when we're doing TLS encryption. All right, so the way I look at this is there are two parts when we're doing TLS encryption, right? The encryption protocol, or the, excuse me, the encryption algorithms themselves operate with or without IT. Right, we can get AES encryption to work just fine uh, writing it on paper, even though it's a little complicated, right? You can get it to work. Uh, what we actually need, though, to do web encryption is some mechanism to negotiate our encryption session. So we have a client and a server, we need some way to negotiate the connection between the two of them so that we can implement the encryption protocols that we're using to actually encrypt our data and have that all done in a way that's secure so that somebody can't intercept the data in the middle and use that to capture our encryption keys and decrypt the data or have somebody else decrypt the data that we don't want them to, right? So we have two components here. We have our negotiating encryption sessions and our encryption protocols, or excuse me, our encryption, this should be encryption algorithms, not protocols, my mistake. When we talk about encrypting sessions here, this negotiation process, there's two terms that come up, SSL and TLS. This is one of the areas of IT that drives me mad, all right? Which do we use here, SSL or TLS? Uh, we're using TLS. SSL is just what we call it, but we're actually using TLS, right? Actually, even, even in Wireshark, when you want to look at your TLS traffic, you have to put in SSL in the filter. It's kind of like DHCP, right? If you want to see your DHCP traffic, what do you type into your filter? Boot P. Where do we use boot P? Maybe one person in the room has ever used boot P before, right? That might be me. <laughs> a couple of you, right? At any rate, so there's, it, it's, it's, a, it's an arcane term, and we mix them up constantly. And it's, it's okay in the vernacular normally to just use them interchangeably, but ultimately when we're talking about protocols, we are talking about TLS. And the reason that we're talking about TLS is because SSL, the actual SSL protocols themselves, are old and broken and can be hacked, right? So we don't want to be using them. This, this SSL itself is old, all right? Uh, SSL came out shortly after Netscape Navigator came out. Netscape Navigator came out shortly after Mosaic came out. Mosaic was the very first web browser ever, right? Um, <laughs> so 1994, right after Netscape Navigator came out, there were some uh, uh, enterprise organizations that said, hey, we want to encrypt our data in these web browsers, come up with a protocol. So the story goes that somebody hacked together SSL v2 uh, over a day or two period uh, and implemented it. There's only a few months that, ha that passed before there were some serious issues with V2. SSL V3 came out, 1995, right? When did we stop using SSL V3? Uh, probably not yet, <laughs> right? 
there's probably some, some, some company out there that has SSL v3 enabled on some system that they can't upgrade for reasons X, Y, and Z. Right, so we're using, we, we're, we have the potential of using protocols that are uh, more than 20 years old here. Uh, time passed, uh, and the name changed. Oh, skipped one. T the name changed from SSL to TLS. The name changed because of the browser wars, right? The browser wars happened in the mid-90s. Uh, Microsoft put Internet Explorer on everything. They wanted to get Netscape out of the picture, right? Um, so Microsoft, when, uh, when the protocol for SSL turned into an RFC, Microsoft got their fingers in there and said, nope, we don't want that terminology anymore that's related to Netscape. We're going to change it to TLS, Transport Layer Security. Fine. So now we have this mess of terminology that we're still stuck with today. Time passed, right? Um, Several versions happened here, TLS 1.0, 1.1, 1.2 came out 10 years ago, 2008. By 2013, finally, the big uh, OS makers here had uh, 1.2 enabled for uh, their browsers. <coughs> so it was only five years ago that that happened when we're using uh, a proper version, or at least the, uh, a relatively proper version of TLS for our encryption, at least having it enabled on popular browsers. Uh, just now, in March, we have TLS 1.3 hit inter internet draft state, which, may, which means that there's organizations using it now. Cloudflare, Facebook, they're actually using TLS 1.3 um, to uh, uh, build the encryption. Now, TLS 1.3 is really cool, I think. It reduces the handshake length considerably and uh, changes the way the encryption happens which is, I think, really, really nifty. So we're going to take a look at that when we do the, uh, when we go into Wireshark and actually look at the handshake. So the versions we want to be using, we want to avoid anything pre-version 1.2 if necessary. A real, I've worked in organizations, I worked in healthcare, right, where uh, vendors will build servers for medical things that get approved by the FDA, which means that you can't update anything on them. This, if you sat through Mike Kershaw's talk prior to this, uh, you would realize that this is prolific in industry, right? Because they're unsolvable problems to some degree. But if we can, we want to be using TLS 1.2 and hopefully soon 1.3. Data encryption basics, right? Let's go through this relatively quickly here. Right, we have an HTTPS client and an HTTPS server, right? So we have some web browser. We want to send a request to get some information off that server. So what do we do? We take our message and uh, we run it through some encryption algorithm along with some secret key, all right? Everybody's gonna know the algorithm that we're using or we can at least tell everybody what algorithm we're using. The secret key we don't want anybody to know about. Either way, we end up with a secret message that we can send across the public network. Once it gets to the server, the server is going to, of course, undo what was just done, passing that encrypted message back through the same encryption algorithm using the same encryption key to get the decrypted message. With the intention here that no one on the public side of the network knows what that message was, only the client and the server do. The issue though is that how do you get that key transferred between the two points, right? This is where all the nifty, nifty, cool, wild, crazy math comes in. All right, so we don't want to be sending that key over our public network at all, all right? So, in order to do the data encryption, we need to get the key, which means that we need some kind of key exchange mechanism involved here. So part of TLS encryption is doing the data encryption itself, but the more important part here is getting the key exchange between the client and the server. So how do we do that? Well, this is where the math comes in. This is where the nifty math comes in. So we want both the client and the server to have the same exact key. We don't want anybody else to know about it. No problem. Several people did this, right? Uh, we have uh, RSA, Rivish Shamir Edelman did this with the RSA protocol. RSA we don't use much anymore. Uh, we try to avoid it uh, because I think 2006, 2008, it was reversed 
using uh, some relatively inexpensive computing hardware over two months or so. So uh, Diffie Hellman is a little bit more sophisticated, a little more difficult to reverse. So how does this work? Well, when we're connecting to an HTTPS server, the server sends a certificate, right? And the certificate, part of it is to, the, the big purpose of the certificate is to validate that the server is who it says it is. But included in that certificate are two prime numbers. We're gonna call them P and G here. Uh, P, I just picked two numbers here that are simple. P is 149, G is 17. Of course, in the certificate, these numbers are gonna be significantly larger. But Excel spreadsheets don't deal with those significantly larger numbers so well. So we'll just pick these simple numbers. What's gonna happen then is after the client gets the certificate, it's gonna grab those two values. The client is then going to pick its, a private key value. Now this private key value is not going to be shared to anyone. In fact, that private key, uh, ideally, the operating system is gonna try to hide that private key so that even the administrator can't get access to it. Right, so the private key is really, really, really a big, big deal. It's meant to be kept as secret as possible. So, what, what are we gonna do? With these three numbers, we can actually calculate something. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take, uh, we're gonna take our value of G that was in our public certificate, we're gonna raise it to the power of our private key. So G to the power of A. It's not a big deal. Then we're gonna do a modulus of P. Now the modulus is the one that I think scares most people who took math at some point, but are like, well what the heck is a modulus, right? So the modulus, uh, if you have kids in the United States right now, they're probably learning a super easy version to do modulus. Right, if you learn math like me, we'll do a quick math lesson here. If you learn math like me, you learn long division, right? 95 divided by eight, put the little thingy on there. We, we do the long version of this and uh, we get eight goes into 95, 11 point something times, right? And I remember in like third grade, we didn't care about this point something, something, something here. What we cared about was the remainder, right? This number left over of seven. Well, the seven, that remainder, that's our modulus. That's what we're after, right? So it's just the remainder value that we're after. It sounds a lot fat, fancier, uh, I think, to talk about it, but uh, with, with the word modulus, and uh, you can confuse and uh, intimidate people by talking about modulus, but ultimately it's just the remainder of a division problem. <coughs> So, here we go. So we have g to the power of a mod p, so let's just do that math. 17 to the power of eight mod 149, we get five. So this five value, this value now is a number that we're gonna send across the public network, right? Is five our encryption key? No. Five is kind of like an encrypted session key, all right, but it's special. So we send that across our public network to the server. The server's gonna hold on to that value. All right, so the server's gonna hold on to that value for a moment. Server's gonna go through this same exact calculation. It's gonna pick its own private key. There it is. It's gonna pick its own private key. Uh, it's gonna run it through the calculation here. G to the power of B mod P. 17 to the power of six mod 149, we get 16 this time. So we take that 16 value now that the server calculated, just like the client calculated five, the server calculated 16, it's gonna send it across to the server. <laughs> Do I keep hitting the wrong key? I think so. So we have now 16 on the client side that was sent from the server, five on the server side that was sent from the client, we're gonna run it through the same exact formula again. So this time we're gonna take that encrypted key value, raise it to the power of our private key, mod P. Do the same thing on the server side, and what we'll get is we're gonna get the same exact value on both sides. So on the client side, we get 129. On the server side, we get 129. No one in the middle can know about this unless 
unless each of the, the server's private key and the client's private key were somehow made known, right? So the only way we can get these two values is if the private key of the server side is six and the private key of the client side is eight. Get key 129. Now, 129 is kind of a useless key here because it's too short, right? It's, it's just too, too small of a key. <clears throat> I found somebody online that had a really nice Python script to do this calculation for you. You just punch in a couple values. I actually modified it a little bit and I put it on the USB thumb drive. So if you want to play around with Diffie-Hellman math and see how nifty it is, you can just punch in some numbers and it'll actually give you equivalent keys that are all kinds of varying sizes, right? So I, I'm not going to demonstrate that here. I just thought it was nifty, for lack of a better description. So this key exchange in this case, requires some information from the certificate itself. It requires the P and G value. Those are the public values that it's in the certificate. So the whole point here is that both sides have this key of 129. No one in the, on the internet or on a public network heard about it. So this is the key exchange that is so critical to doing TLS encryption with web browsing, right? So when we talk about the key exchange process here now, uh, if we're using TLS 1.2 and some versions earlier than that, we have a couple options to do the key exchange. All right, one is RSA, one is using Diffie-Hellman, which I just showed you, another one is using elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman. We'll talk about that in just a second. RSA, it's not broken, it's just not good to use, right? If we're using RSA to do our key exchange, we can grab our private keys and the, excuse me, we can grab some certificate information from our server and actually use that in Wireshark to decrypt our traffic. But we have to force the server and the browser to use RSA encryption, or excuse me, RSA to do our key exchange. Now, again, it's not a good idea to be using RSA for our key exchange, so we want to avoid that. So, RSA is kind of off the table for the most part when we're talking about production uh, encryption systems here. So we want to use either Diffie-Hellman or elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman, which means that we can't use the certificates to actually decrypt our traffic in Wireshark. What we're going to need is we're going to need access to that session key that was computed with that math I just showed you. Once we get to TLS 1.3, Diffie-Hellman is off the table as well. In TLS 1.3, our only option is elliptical curve. All right, well, what the heck is this? So let's talk about elliptical curve, Diffie, Hellman, ephemeral. What's happening here, that's all me. I'm pushing the wrong button. That's what's happening. So what's happening with elliptical curve, Diffie, Hellman is that we, we just use a formula to create an elliptical curve on a graph, effectively. Uh, the curve that we pick, there are different specifications for the curve type we can use. Browsers and servers are going to support some variety of these different curve types, and I've just listed the specification names for them. So we're going to pick one of these curves, or maybe two of these curves, so that we can start our encryption. The way that the encryption works without going into the heavy math uh, is that we draw a line through the curve and pick three points. That curve type plus these three points becomes effectively our public key. All right, that's the public information that everybody can know about. So when we are actually transferring this, I'm going to talk about TLS 1.3, how, how it works with uh, Diffie-Hellman ephemeral. When, we're, when we do this in TLS 1.3, what's going to happen is the client is going to pick a curve type. It's going to pick those three points on the curve, and then it's going to use that information plus its private key to come up with the encrypted key. And it's going to send that in one big chunk of data over to the server. The server's going to go, great, I see you're using this curve type. I see these are the points on the curve. Uh, I'm going to use my own private key to calculate my own encrypted key to send across the wire. Boom, we send that over to our client. 
Now the client has our encrypted key, the curve type, and the points. So now we can use some of our fancy math again to come up and compute the same key on both sides. The big advantage of doing the elliptical curve is that we can come up with a much stronger key using much simpler math. All right? Not simpler math, less computationally intensive math. How about that? So we can come up with a, a stronger key with less computationally intensive math, which allows us to uh, have both devices have the same key, just like we did with Diffie-Hellman. The big advantage of using uh, Diffie-Hellman ephemeral here is that these session keys that we generate on both sides, we're going to use to generate more keys with the idea that we're going to provide something called perfect forward secrecy. The idea behind perfect forward secrecy is that, let's say I am a man in the middle here. No, I cannot figure out what the key is today, but I capture all of your data. And then I wait. And I wait, 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 until someday I figure out how to reverse engineer Diffie-Hellman elliptical curve. The idea here is that the math apparently says that you will never be able to find the session keys out no matter how long you wait. But if you've worked in IT long enough, <laughs> right, you know that that's, the possibility of that right now is true. That may not be true in the future. So regardless, the idea here is that Diffie-Hellman Elliptical is providing us a modern, current version of perfect forward secrecy. Does this make sense? We're good so far? All right, so we talked about the key exchange, data encryption, right? Data encryption, we have only a few ciphers we can use here. Uh, you can argue with me about a couple points on here, and that's fine, all right? Uh, we have triple DES encryption, which I've listed as 168 bits. That's debatable. Um, but triple DES um, was followed up with AES, right? 128 or 256 bit encryption here. The rumor is, is that the NSA infiltrated the AES, the committee that wrote AES, and there's a back door in it apparently. But whatever, what are we gonna do about that? We need something, right? So AES using 128 or 256 bit encryption. Uh, we can sign this, we can, we can create a signature either using something called Galway counter mode or cipher block chaining. Did get that right? At, uh, a counter blockchain, right? Sorry. <laughs> counter blockchain here. So what we're doing is we're taking our encrypted data and all we're doing is we're creating a signature for it so that we can make sure that the data that was sent is the same as the data that was received, right? We're just creating some type of, of mechanism for verifying that. Another encryption protocol we can use is ChaCha20. That's going to use Poly1305 for a signature. Really, we want to avoid using triple DES if possible, and stick with either AES or ChaCha20. Uh, we're going to find out that the cipher suites that are supported really only support a few encryption algorithms anyway. So there's really not a whole lot to talk about here, because once you have the encryption algorithm that you're choosing, plus your secret key, uh, you can encrypt the data quite easily. So key exchange, data encryption. We have two more components that are being negotiated when we're using TLS encryption. And that's our handshake integrity. This is another mechanism that we're going to use now to make sure that our handshake was not tampered with. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a small piece of each part of the handshake. We're going to take that small part of each part of the handshake. We're going to combine it together and then run it through a hash algorithm, either SHA-256 SHA or SHA-384. And that will then be sent in the final message from the client to the server and from the server to the client. And what that's going to do is it's going to ensure that we can now calculate to find out if somebody tampered with our handshake during the process, seeing if they act somebody actually messed with our messages trying to get our encryption keys uh, or our session keys or any information, right, trying to do any kind of man in the middle. This is going to help us verify that. The last component here of, uh, of TLS encryption uh, that's negotiated or transferred in the handshake is to verify our server authenticity. I think this is a piece that becomes the most challenging to talk about when we're talking about encryption. 
right? This is the component that our browser is using to determine if the green lock shows up or if we get an error message, right? Uh, the big issue with this is this is where the certificates are used, right? The certificates are, uh, if we're using RSA or Diffie-Hellman, this is where our public key is. All right, so the public key is contained in the certificate itself, if we're using RSA or Diffie-Hellman. All right, that's the P and the G value. But if we're using elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman, the certificate is meaningless. We're not doing anything with the certificate for the elliptical curve stuff. We don't need it. All we're using the certificate for now is for verification. Right, and we're using it to validate based on a certificate chain with a signed certificate from a certificate authority. How easy is it to become a certificate authority nowadays? Probably pretty easy. And I think this topic could be broken out and debated for hours. So we're not gonna debate that for hours, we're just gonna say that, yeah, this kind of works. <laughs> and keep our fingers crossed. Um, so let's talk about the TLS handshake. So now we have an understanding, right, of what's happening. We're, we're doing, what we need to do is we need to negotiate some information about what protocols we're gonna use, how are we going to do the key exchange, how are we going to do encryption, how are we going to do handshake integrity. So let's just go into Wireshark to do this. Yeah. Why can't you see that? So in, in order to see our handshake, we need to know how to decrypt data. And I've tried, this, I've tried to do this a couple different ways. Uh, the audience overwhelmingly demanded that I show you how to get your session key and decrypt the data before I show you the handshake. So let's look at how to do that first. I'm using Windows. You can do this in Mac. Uh, it's a little more finicky. I talked to Peter Wu uh, at, at uh, drinks the other night and he gave me some tips on how to best do it in Mac, but it's finicky, all right? When we're doing it in Windows, it's a lot easier to get it right the first time. Linux, you can get it right the first time a little bit easier as well. So I'll show you how to do it in Windows here. In Windows, really all you need to do is we need to just uh, uh, create an environment variable to grab our SSL keys. Now I'm, I'm, I can't imagine that this feature is going to be available forever in operating systems. Because imagine how easy it would be to write a piece of malware to just grab your SSL keys from your session and send it off to anybody that you want. Especially after you see how easy this is. So uh, what we need to do is we need to go to our system control panel. So we go into system control panel. We go into advanced system settings. Wow, that is remarkably tiny. <laughs> That's slightly better. Need more. Better? So we go into our um, environment variables, and this is what we want to add. Uh, we, we add this variable called SSL key log file, all caps, and then we give it a spot to put it. I just have it in my documents folder. All right, and then what's going to happen is anytime we use a browser that's capable of exporting your uh, SSL session key, it's going to export it and it's going to dump it into this log file that's in my documents folder. All right, compatible browsers as of today are going to be either Firefox or Chrome. 
And word on the street that I've heard is that Chrome doesn't like this and they might be deprecating it eventually. Firefox right now is, we're okay with. We can, we can do this in Firefox. Uh, if you are, we just hit okay, okay here then. If you're using some load balancer equipment, uh, I was just talking to a guy that's doing uh, some uh, Citrix Netscaler load balancing with SSL offload. Uh, there's a way to get that SSL log, key log file off of the load balancer so that engineers can do troubleshooting as well. So there are ways to get these keys depending upon the equipment you have access to. If we're just doing it from the client side, this is what we need to do. So uh, now that we have that, uh, let's open up Wireshark. Uh, we'll start a capture. And then I'm going to go to Pluralsight.com. You do not need a special version of Firefox. And uh, I'm guessing I'm not going to get to Pluralsight on Bluetooth. Try this again. So whenever I do web captures with websites, I always open an incognito window. Just make sure I'm not getting a cached version. HTTPS, Pluralsight.com. There we go. Close the website. and stop the capture. So let me uh, find the Pluralsight website here. Frame contains Pluralsight. And we should find our client, hello. And I can do a follow TCP stream. So right now, uh, Pluralsight is using TLS version 1.2 which is pretty common right now for most modern websites that are doing it mostly correctly. Oh, it looks like I've already decrypted. So, how do I know I'm decrypted already? I, yeah, we see some HTTP traffic. HTTP 2 is showing up here. All right, well, how did that happen? Well, if I go into my protocol preferences for SSL, Right, right here, there is a file name that we can put here, and that is our uh, session keylog file name. If I get rid of that, we lose our decryption, right? And everything becomes application data that was once HTTP data. Even in our handshake, let's take a look at the handshake now, and then I'll add, in that, key, I'll add that key back in in just a second. So if we look at what's happening here, our client, hello, we have our three-way handshake, SYN, SYNAC, ACK, right? That establishes um, our session, our layer, our layer four session. Then we have our client, hello, and this is the client, this is the web browser saying, hey, I want to set up a TLS session. And it's going to try to negotiate this, right? So it's going to try to say, hey, I want to set up a session. I want to use TLS 1.2. So inside of our SSL information here, inside of the record, we look in here, and uh, it includes several pieces of information. We have a random number that's also based on the time along with a session ID. Uh, and it's going to send a list of supported protocol suites. Here's the server name of Pluralsight.com, where we're trying to reach. And then we're also going to send here. Thank you. There they are. It's going to send a list of cipher suites. Right? And this, this is messy. If you're a newbie to this, this is messy. This looks, this looks overwhelming. Right? But really, it's not so bad if we look at it. Right? Uh, the, the first couple here are actually for uh, using elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman using TLS 1.3. The other ones here are saying, all right, for 1.2 and lower, we're going to use elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman ephemeral. 
Uh, we have a signature, elliptical curve digital signature algorithm that we can use. Uh, with AES, 128-bit encryption, Galway counter mode using SHA-256 as our handshake integrity. So really we just have all of these, these, these cipher suites that we're choosing from is really just combinations of just a couple different options, right? What are we gonna use for our key exchange? Is it gonna be RSA? Is it gonna be elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman? Notice that Diffie-Hellman isn't even in that list anymore. For the uh, encryption itself, are we gonna use uh, AES? Or are we gonna use Cha Cha 20? Is it gonna be 256 AES or 128 AES? And then the last part there for our uh, handshake integrity, which version of SHA? SHA-256, SHA-384, or straight SHA? Right? So the suites that we're using here, this is just the client saying, these are the suites that I support. What are we going to use, server? The server is going to come back with its own hello message. All right, and the server hello... is gonna come back and it's gonna say, well, which Cypher suite are we gonna use? It says, well, we're just gonna pick one here. We're gonna pick uh, uh, ephemeral, um, elliptical curve, Diffie-Hellman and ephemeral uh, using an RSA signature. The RSA signature is fine because it's just verifying that the data sent is the data received. We're gonna use 128-bit AES encryption using Galway counter mode for our signature and then SHA-256 for handshake integrity. After that, our server is going to send a certificate. So the server then sends its certificate information right here, and you can actually drill down and see the certificate. You can see the name here. Certificate is star.pluralsite.com. I don't know how I feel about the wild cards there, but that's fine. Additionally, in another message inside of the same message, we're going to send uh, the parameters here. So here we go. We're going to do our key exchange. The key exchange parameters here, just like I said, we are going to pick the curve we're going to use. Here is SECP 256R1. That's the elliptical curve protocol that we're using. And then it sends what, what is labeled in Wireshark as the public key. Now this public key is a combination of that curve type, plus those three points, plus that encrypted key that was calculated using the private key on the server side. Right, so it's sending that all together in one message. You can see the signature in it as well. And then the server says, all right, I'm done. We're all done. You have, you have all the information you need to start doing the encryption. We know what Cypher suites to use, you have my, you have my uh, Diffie Hellman key exchange information. The client comes back, says, Great. Uh, client then sends its key to the server, says, Yeah, we are using, here's my elliptical curve Diffie Hellman parameters, here's my public key, saying, Yep, I use that curve type with those three points you sent me, I use my private key, and I calculated this value, here you go. After that, encryption starts, all right? So after that, everything after this is encryption. So this, the client is sending something to the server, but it's all encrypted now, right? Because both sides have the encryption key. They have a session key that we can now use to actually do the encryption of the messages. So now in Wireshark, we can't see anymore. There's more handshake to happen, but we just can't see it, all right? So this is where we need our session key. So let's add that back in. To add that back in, we just right click on the TLS there, go to protocol preferences, SSL, and we find that log file that we generated. I put it in my documents folder. There we go. So now, my messages here are no longer encrypted, but there's nothing that fancy that's happening here. It just says, ah, I'm finished. Right? If you look at the hex of that, there's actually information in that finished message. So if I click on finished here, there's actually some data being sent, and this is our handshake integrity. 
right? We look then at the server. The server is going to send its finished message. It's going to say, yep, here we go. Uh, we're all done now. I'm finished as well. That's for the handshake integrity there. Sends that over to the client. We're good to go. The client can then immediately start sending its HTTP request. I'm a real novice with HTTP2, but I'm assuming this, this request here is just some kind of get request. Some of these actually say magic, which is how I feel about it, right? Okay, H, who's magic? <laughs> but then the website gets transferred, right? That's effectively what's happening here. So the TLS process for 1.2, um, client sends a hello, server sends a hello, Server sends some certificate information, encryption information, client sends that back with its own encryption information, and then we start passing data. Make sense? All right, so when we look at TLS 1.3, TLS 1.3 is really slick. So we have our three-way handshake, SIN, SYNAC, ACK. I do not have the session key in here yet. We look at our client hello. The client hello already knows which key exchange mechanism we're gonna use. So what it does is it just says, well, I'm gonna guess. I'm gonna take a guess here. What was the question again? In, in, in TLS 1.3, it's always going to use elliptical curve Diffie Hellman for the key exchange, right? So we don't know what encryption we're going to use yet, but we do know that it's going to be elliptical curve Diffie Hellman. So what the client is going to do is this, it says, I'm just going to guess. I'm going to guess which curve type is supported here. Sometimes the client will actually even send two different curve types in the same message. So in this case, we're saying, well, the curve type we're going to use is the X25519, and here's my key. So right in the client hello, the client is like, yeah, I already know we're going to use elliptical curve. Uh, I'm guessing that you support X25519. Uh, I've calculated my private key. Here's the key exchange. Here you go, server. The server comes back, and it says, server hello, key share, group, 25519. It said, yeah, I support that. Here's my key. And now both sides have the key. Client hello sends the key. Server hello sends the key. Boom, we have the key. If we look at more information in here, What's going on now? In the server hello message, our data is already encrypted, right? So the second message that's sent, our data is already encrypted on this. So now we need our session key in order to see what's happening in our, three, or in our uh, TLS 1.3 handshake. Yeah? What if the server doesn't support that curve type? Uh, I believe the server will just come back and say, we're using this, serve, this curve type, and then the client will come back with that curve type, assuming both are supported, either that or it'll drop it down to the previous version of TLS. Now, I, I did just read a paper about this where uh, TLS 1.3 is having some backward compatibility issues. So it's having a hard, some of it's having a hard time dropping back to TLS 1.2 if it needs to, but this is a constant problem with TLS. So let's get that decrypted and take a look at the rest of that handshake. So I did put all these trace files in the thumb drive, if you want to look at these. They have all of the key files in there. So 
So now we have uh, the server. Server hello information now is no longer encrypted here. We have some information that we can see. The certificate, the server then sends its certificate and it says we're all done. The client comes back and says, yep, we're all done. So the handshake here is a lot shorter, right? And imagine your Facebook, right, saving just a couple pieces of the handshake message could save, you know, gigabytes of, uh, or more of data uh, in, in a transaction throughout the day. So, uh, plus we get our encryption happening much earlier in the conversation, which theoretically can make our conversation a little more secure. After that, we get our HTTP2 data again. I believe this is from Cloudflare. Uh, I got the information from, from Cloudflare because it was super easy to capture. Right? They just have some really nice TLS 1.3 sites up. Their site supports it directly. So if you want to look at this in detail, you can actually go right to their site to check it out. So let's take a look at one more capture here. TLS 1.3 does session resumption just like TLS 1.2 does. Uh, the session resumption here is kind of nifty, and TLS 1.3 does something that I couldn't capture. Um, one thing at a time. So TLS 1.3 can do session resumption. So TLS 1.2 could do this, where if we just sent in the client hello, we say, hey, here's our session ID to the server. The server can resume that session automatically. And this happens super quickly. TLS 1.3 has something like um, I saw Simon talk about yesterday, uh, where you can actually send the, the get request for an HTTP message in the SYN message. Right, what's that called again? Fast, fast open, TCP fast open. Right, so TCP fast open, uh, this is very similar. In our client, I don't have actually a capture of this. I, I really tried hard for you guys to get one, but uh, not successful at it. But in the client hello, with TLS 1.3, we can actually send our get request right away. So, especially with session resumption, right? So we're reducing round trip uh, sessions here. But if we dig into this, the pre-shared key extension actually is just sending the session ID. So here's a session ID that we're sending to the server. The server, if I had this decrypted, the server would immediately send back a message that was encrypted to the client. Right, so our second message then, our server hello message is actually gets encrypted back to the client because they're saying, yeah, we're resuming this session, here we go. So our handshake becomes much, much shorter even. So now we have our server hello message and we say we're done. And that's it, right? So effectively, what, three messages there? We're not even sending the certificate. Or if the certificate is coming. No, we're not even sending the certificate here. So, then we get our HTTP2 magic. Boom. TLS 1.3 is nifty. It's probably not ready for everybody yet. Uh, the support of it is limited on, uh, on a lot of systems, but if you're using some big organizations, if you're using Cloudflare and others like that, you can actually uh, put these certs and or put these uh, uh, put TLS 1.3 as uh, your mechanism for encrypting your data there, or for uh, negotiating that encryption. I guess I'm done a little bit early. Do you guys have questions? Yeah. So uh, the question is, uh, you have, so you, the, the question is, um, client sends you a capture. Let, let me make sure this is your question. Client sends you a capture. Uh, it, you sit on a few days and you need to decrypt it. Uh, can you decrypt it? No. Even if you have the server keys, right? Because what's happening? What? Uh, 
Well, perfect forward sequencing is happening, but why, why aren't the certificates and the key values that you're grabbing from the devices re rele relevant here? Because they're because they're they're stored in that, that the session key is calculated per session, so any private key information that's on the server and the client, if you can get access to it, isn't valuable to doing the decryption. This is going to be a big problem going forward, right? This is going to be a big big problem going forward. So, uh, what are solutions to fix that? Well, in, 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 yeah, in your lab session, you can downgrade your key exchange to RSA. If you own the load balancer and the server. If you own the load balancer and server, right. So in a lab, you can do this. Uh, what's another way? Some company in here is doing this. What's that? R riverbed stuff, uh, uh, SSL offload, right, or doing some kind of uh, man-in-the-middle attack on your own data. Um, who, who, what company does this? Um, Right. And they can be both different versions of TLS in either direction. Correct. And this is exactly what Cloudflare is doing too. If you didn't hear what he said, what, what, what he said was uh, if you have a load balancer, your load balancer can have a TLS 1.3 session to the client. You can have a TLS 1.2 or an SSL version 3 session to the server. And in the middle, your data is decrypted. All right, so you can actually use that, and typically on those load balancer devices where you're offloading your SSL connection, uh, you can actually grab the session keys if you really wanted to decrypt the information right from the client, or you can do a capture right in the middle there and get that data off. What other technology uses this? DLP, data loss prevention. All right, data loss prevention equipment I, I'm, I'm sorry the name is escaping me. My buddy was just talking to me about this. Uh, we were, um, what's that? Oh, Bluecoat Blue Coat does this. Yeah, Bluecoat definitely does this. There's several of them out there. But what, what they're doing is they're putting on uh, the, the, the um, man in the middle attack here to do data loss prevention. Uh, what it's doing is it's, it's spoofing certificates effectively. So you go to Gmail on your corporate network. Uh, you don't actually go and terminate an SSL session with Gmail, it just pretends to. You get a certificate from the blue coat device or some other device that your computer looks at and says, oh yeah, this is valid because blue coat sets it up that way, right? Either you install a, a, a certificate chain of authority on your workstation that accepts that certificate as valid from Google, or uh, Blue Coat itself just gets valid certs for all the organizations it needs, and it already has a trusted chain of authority right on your device. All right, so what's happening then is uh, your device is tricked into thinking that it's building an SSL session to Gmail, but what's actually happening is you're building an SSL session to Blue Coat, Blue Coat builds a separate SSL session to Gmail and passes your traffic through. Now, Blue Coat device can, can snoop on your emails and watch it, right? So this is the other way you do this, right? This is the way, when I was at the hospital, we did this uh, without having a Blue Coat device yet. We just did a man-in-the-middle attack on our own equipment. I was recently at Best Buy, browsing on both LTE and Wi-Fi, and every single website I went to got a cert error, every single one. What's Best Buy doing? Well, Best Buy had their equipment set up wrong, but Best Buy was regenerating the LTE signal. Best Buy had a Wi-Fi network. They were clearly doing a man in the middle. They wanted me to accept a certificate to go to Amazon.com so that when I went to Amazon over a secure connection, they could snoop on my data in the middle. So when we talk about SSL you know, and, and how important it is to implement on our on our networks, the more and more uh, you work with it, right? My buddy worked for a genetics company. And the reason he knew that he was getting man in the middle by his own company was he got an alert from Gmail saying, hey, somebody's logging in from a different IP address than we expected you to. Is this legit? 
We reverse engineer it and found out that it was a cloud provider of data loss prevention, doing a man in the middle on his Gmail. So they're snooping on his Gmail from his corporate network. Obviously, Best Buy was trying this too, right? I'm, this is all theoretical on the Best Buy side, but <laughs> right, it just looked that way. Why would I get a cert error on every website I went to, both on LTE and Wi-Fi? So, any other questions? Yeah. So uh, the, the question was, um, when I went to Pluralsight.com, I didn't put SSL in for, I, excuse me, I did not put my login credentials in there. And the question was, I believe, would I see that in my SSL key log file? No. You would see that in your decrypted HTTP session. Can I log in and show you my credentials? Oh. <laughs> Right, right. Um, I don't know if I can do a live demonstration of that because I don't know how well the HTTP, I don't know how HTTP2 works, right? And you can't always get a clear image of it. I'd have to do some messing around with it because it might use a separate channel. There's all kinds of things that could happen with it. You haven't been successful with that. So that the credentials are going to be in your TCP session, not in that SSL keylog file. Yeah, it's a, it, it takes some digging, I think. And, and it depends upon the system being used to authenticate. Right, I'd have to do some more digging on that. Any other questions? All right, well I hope this is valuable for you guys. Um, uh, if you want to watch more of my content, I do all kinds of network training at Pluralsight. Um, this fall, I'm working on a Wireshark series to do um, beginner to intermediate level Wireshark analysis on Pluralsight. Um, if you want a free trial card, I have stacks of them. So just come and talk to me or stop me around and I'll chat you up. Thanks, everybody.